Okay. I offered everybody the chance to speak if they wanted to. Any other comments on that last session? Well, thank goodness. And thank goodness it's Friday too. So very happy to hand off our next session to John. All yours, John. All right. Uh, so going into lecture 18 is Hamming's introduction to simulation. And it's the constant question of the what if and then the why for simulation. And then he goes into some best practices and the needs for expert. And then he goes back to some topics that we just talked about, which with communication and language when he talks about jargon. And that, it kind of all comes full circle. In fact, as Don, as you were talking about a lot of things at the beginning part of this class, I was referencing forward to today's simulation talk, and there's a lot of parallels. So he always talked of why do we want to do it? And then there's some use cases and we'll continue from there. And for anybody in the audience, feel free to jump in and add viewpoints or what your interpretations of the readings and videos were. Uh, so, you know, the, the quintessential question of why do we do something? And as computers advance, it this all becomes cheaper, becomes faster, and the computer can often do a lot of things better. But there's some caveats to that that I'll talk to in a little bit. And then you can do what you cannot do in a lab sometimes with a simulation. And arguably, something that I pulled out was it's often more repeatable with a computer-based simulation because we control all the variables and all the inputs. We don't have as much random. We control what is the random inputs. As we know, he helped develop the atom bomb. So early years while working on it, he and his peers found the need to have to simulate how we, they're gonna simulate the exterior shells of the bomb collapsing, what was the, gonna be the atomic forces, what were gonna be the physical forces on the different parts of the bomb and then the radioactive effects. And being able to measure that at each different part was how he gained insight on how the actual real atomic bomb explosion was gonna happen. Because obviously they couldn't test this except once or twice at the very end, but as they were going iteratively, they could not test this in a real environment because of the danger. And those shells that I just referenced is their diagram on the right-hand side. And this is a direct quote from him. They divided the material in space into many concentric shells. And then they wrote the equations for the force on each shell. So that that way then they could simulate each step of the explosion as it happened and then repeat that. And those equations among the others, the density of the material, pressures, et cetera. And they broke it all down. And this was his very simple model and actually in the video, he added to this design where he had different inputs coming in on the outsides of the shells, which were the initial explosions that were providing that initial force for the collapsing of the, the shells into the, the center atomic material. Now, that need for expert knowledge is going to come up again and again. And he, being a mathematician and engineer, may not have always been the expert in the exact simulation that he was working on. And so he always honed in on this point that you needed to reach out to those experts and bring them in on the team because you might be the mathematician or you might be the statistician or you might be the, the, the master at the computer inputs and the computer simulation. But if you don't understand that whole problem, you're going to miss something or you're not going to have it accurate. You might think the simulation works, but then it ends up being useless once it goes to the field. And he has this great quote here. He goes, I've seen experts in simulation ignore this element, in fact, and think that they could do it safely in simulations on their own. Only an expert in the field of the application can know it. And what you have failed to include is, a vi is vital to the accuracy of the simulation or if it can be safely ignored. So if, you don't, if you're not that expert, you're not going to be that expert to be able to make the call as to what can be included and what cannot be included in that simulation. And then with that becomes the validation. As you're putting together all the different pieces of a simulation, you've got numerous components. 
and whether or not they're fit together correctly and the output of one feeds into the input of another or vice versa. And you as the non-expert are, are, are gonna have no clue of how that's gonna happen. And then that final point, which I mentioned earlier is, is it relevant to realities? Once you take it out of the sim world, will it apply to real life? And within all simulation, the concept of stability is going to be ever present. And as the data that has large degrees of instability is going to make for a poor candidate to simulation because there's going to be more random inputs or variation and change that's going to be less degree of predictability as simulations continue. And then a great deal of money and time and effort and your time, your boss's time, the organization that you're working for is going to be wasted if you pick a problem off the bat, that's not going to ever be a good candidate for simulation. And I think that's kind of a, a takeaway that I took from this was learning to recognize the right tools for the right problem sets. As we have the future bosses, we have the current bosses that say, hey, you're good at this. Run me a simulation or run me a model on this because they don't understand that that may or may not be the right tool set for it. Now in Hamming's day, especially early on in the 1940s, they didn't have as much of a problem with information overload. Their simulations that he was running both at Los Alamos and then on at Bell Labs were taking 30, 40 minutes, an hour for that computer of that day to, to run the different computations. So they gave him critical time to think and to gain insight and not be overwhelmed with a computer outputting thousands of results from thousands of simulations that it can run in a matter of minutes. Going back to Professor Eisenhower's class that I took last year, we could run simple simulations that were just for an example's sake, but we could run them on modern computers in milliseconds and then get thousands of results out. And then parsing through that data can become very time consuming, very hard. And if you're not knowing what you're looking for, it's just, spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of information. Whereas in Hammond's day, he knew he was running one simulation at a time. He got one result out. From there, he can make course corrections and run another simulation. So it's, it's a plus and a minus to what we have now because he spent a lot of time just running one. We get a whole bunch, but now we potentially have a lot of overload. But that time that he had, he deemed to be critical to gain insight. As you have the time to think, and you have the time to think through the different possibilities, that self-reflection on the problem and self-reflection on your knowledge provides the opportunity for insight. A uh, case in point that he brings up was working on the Nike missile system. And there's an example right there. The solution time for one trajectory, one simulation was a half an hour. So every time he was critically thinking, repeating equations, deriving new equations for future simulations and continually refining. And there's on the right-hand picture is the actual picture of the Nike missile family that he was working on while at Bell Laboratories. And he had this belief of start simple and then move up to more complicated systems. He started simulations for the missile systems using uh, continuous wave experimentations in order to determine the, the external forces and the taper for those Nike missile systems. And then as he continued to do the simulations, continued to evolve it based on the insights that time gave him and then based on the simplicity that let him build up the system in a building block approach. And that insight has another effect, the time that's saved. Through simulating that previously mentioned traveling wave design for the, the missiles, he was able to compute the ideal taper of the missile tube. In doing that, his insight estimated the nonlinear components of the nonlinear equations that he had time to go through and derive as his other simulations were running. And then he was able to put those back into the future simulations. So ultimately he ran less simulations 
because he was able to derive a lot of the mathematics during that time, which then led him to not have to run as many long 30, 40 minute um, simulations. And he will be a self, he will self proclaim and he does so in both the, the paper and uh, I believe it was in the video too, that he was an amateur when it came to missile design. He was a mathematician at heart. He was not a ballistics engineer. He was not an aeronautical engineer, but yet he was able to derive ideal silo and taper and wing size for these uh, missile systems. But he didn't do that alone. He was an amateur with an active mind, but he brought together people around him and he learned the jargon of the experts. And it's an interesting word that he uses, the jargon. And I think in the military, we have a, a problem with using jargon all the time. We speak in acronyms and to the, the foreigners in the room or the guests in the room, they don't understand anything we say. We might say that to our significant others, to our spouses, and they look at us with a blank stare because we're speaking in an acronym. And he always made a point that in any new, you know, profession as it were that he was jumped that he was pushed into or he picked himself to go into whether at bell laboratories or after that he would try to run with the experts of the field surround himself by the experts pick up the books of the experts understand that jargon because if you don't understand it you will be subconsciously separated from the group those who do know the jargon will think you don't understand what they're talking about and rightfully so you probably don't understand it but if you do understand it, you can be part of that group and you can understand where, what they're saying, you can interpret what they're saying, and you might be able to call out at times, and he actually said to do this, call out at times when they're wrong, when they are misinterpreting their own jargon, or they're using it as a placeholder, as a filler in their problem set. But jargon's a double-edged sword. And there at the bottom, beware of jargon as it is a necessity and an curse because the use of jargon can be a block of thinking outside of the box. Those of us who overuse it, we, it is easy for us to say it, it's easy for us to use it, and we know what we mean, but it might not actually be the full definition of what we're trying to get across. And he emphasized the necessity to master it. His Example was picking up chemistry books in order to learn, understand the different words. And every field has this. So it's a constant learning experience from the husband and wife to a team of rocket scientists. Everyone has their own unique way of communicating. It might be subliminal. It might be through gestures, through motions, through actual keywords in the military with, with acronyms, even here at MPS with acronyms. So that to the rocket scientists who are going to use very precise scientific language for a lot of things, and it may not always be accurate. So it's a double-edged sword. But mathematics is another one of those languages. Understanding the symbols doesn't necessarily make you a mathematician, as it is each of those symbols can be interpreted in slightly different ways. He goes about with one example when they were working through a problem set. And he brought in an expert in the field, the guy that asked him to help run these simulations. And he went through painstaking degree of detail, I believe it was 28 linear equations with, oh, sorry, 28 differential equations with this individual. And he made him encode it with him alongside. And the beauty of that was they both were looking at the same problem sets, but with two different interpretations. The expert in the field had the interpretation that was ultimately the right one because he was the expert in the field and was able to identify problem set with the actual encoding of these 28 differential equations. Sorry, I meant to go to the next slide. And that was for Navy intercept simulations. Hamming's interpretation was carrying forward an error that was due to a lack of intimate knowledge of the problem. Uh, it was specific to a thin limitation with these missile intercepts. Now, Hamming being a mathematician kind of always brings back a lot of 
a lot of his talks to mathematics. And I think every mathematician agrees with this first statement that nearly all situations can be described that can be described with mathematics can be simulated. But then the converse of that is almost all situations can be described mathematically. Now, some of the highlights that we've talked about before was the unstable situations. Now, just because you can describe it in mathematics, if it's unstable, is it going to make for a good simulation? Now, inaccuracy in simulations can lead to the abandonment of good ideas. He talks about a colleague that he worked with that basically threw out a problem, an idea, because of inaccuracies at the beginning. Another colleague picked up that idea and ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize for it. So imagine that, that first scientist's mindset after he saw his problem that he threw away get picked up and win the premier award for physicists. And now answers for important problems exist and determination is the only way to find them. That is a, a key point that I keep seeing throughout all of Hammond's work and his lectures is you have to s s seek the problem, tackle the problem, and always look for that next issue to solve. Nothing's going to come from, you know, sitting back and being lazy. And I think that is the 17th of 17 slides. It is. John, that's super. Make sure you get that. Always be looking for the next problem. Uh, please append that on your slide. That's that's a great one. Thank you for preparing these slides as well as the presentation. This is one of the talks we didn't have. Absolutely. Other comments? funny to hear that he thought of not wasting time when the simulation runs. I think uh, Bert has the same, uh, had the same experience in the beginning when he had his old computer and started his uh, thesis work, compiling everything for the whole lens. And every compile did about five minutes. And you, you thought twice, is everything fixed? Is there any other issue? Because once you start to compile, you have to wait five minutes just to see you forgot something and have to do it again. I, I think it, uh, it costs a bunch of money to buy a new computer, right? Yeah, it was pretty expensive, but uh, what, what shall I say? My old computer had four cores and my new one has 12 cores and the 12 cores is <laughs> faster, of course, yeah, sure. And it was pretty, pretty cool to say, okay, um, now I'm able to say, okay, is everything fixed? I don't care, I press a button, one minute later, I have it on the HoloLens and can uh, try it. So absolutely, device, absolutely. It was horrible, horrible, wasting time. Maybe maybe in our times, Hemming wouldn't have been so productive because he, he <laughs> would not have 40 minutes <laughs> sitting around feeling bored and uh, starting to think about problems, uh, waiting 30 seconds for a simulation outcome. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would have been a, a different time for him. John, on one of your early slides, you talked about repeatability. And uh, Toby, that's a big topic for you. Do you want to react to the notion of repeatability? He said, arguably, it's a fifth technique. Do you mind uh, flashing that on the screen? For just a moment, John, and Toby talked to me. Yeah. Um, for my thesis, I came up with three definitions of repeatable. The first and most obvious one when it comes to MNS is replayable. And I said, okay, uh, simulation is repeatable when you can record it and replay it again and again and again in the identically way it was run the first time. The second definition I, I came up with was, was uh, the simulation seed consistency. So you use pseudo random number generators and you have one seed 
and you start a simulation over and over again, and because of your, the, the starting seed is consistent every run, you will have the same outcomes every time. And when you inject other entities, for the entities within the simulation to react to, the fights will always end in the same way because you have the same simulation seed. And the last um, definition I came up with was a simulation seed variability. So you repeat and repeat and repeat the simulation again, but you vary your seed. But you inject entities into the simulation but at the same time, at the same point, at the same location. But now the simulation reacts in different ways. So that's one way, I think, in a combat, in the, in the combat simulation class we did this, they called this stochastic or stochastic outcome of simulation. So we have three different definitions of repeatable and just having, just knowing what repeatable means for you does not mean that everyone else has the same definition in his mind. So that sounds like three arguments that are arguably uh, about repeatability. So that sounds pretty, pretty strong. Yeah, I find that, I find that a very interesting uh, discussion. You know, my, my PhD also was in the simulation of pedestrians evacuating buildings and things like that. But, you know, during our thesis work, we had to, one of the courses required us to actually code and create our own random number generator that wasn't one of the pseudo random number generators so that you could really ensure that, you know, and this was in the molecular dynamic simulation class that we had, you know, simulating the interaction of molecules and then getting the, the entropy and the other things that Hemings even talked about a little bit. But, you know, it, the repeatability of a simulation and the fact that you can, with computers, do it so quickly, that's one of the, the biggest advantages. And, you know, it's funny, that slide there that John had up, that third slide on the reasons for simulations, I mean, I think those are still, even today, verbatim, the same reasons that in the class I taught, to John, why we do simulations, you know, so those haven't changed at all over the course. It's just computers have gotten a lot better. And, you know, he said in there also that like 99% of experiments would be done on computers. And I think that's completely true. You know, everything starts with computer simulations. And then, you know, and then when you're ready, then you go into the actual process of building a prototype or building the the actual physical model and then you know putting it in a lab or in a controlled environment and then testing it so i find that interesting the other thing i was thinking about as i was reading through this you know he talked a lot about using the experts and you're using the experts essentially for model validation right is your model doing you know is your model rat matching reality what would be interesting to ask Hamming or to find out is through this process and what he was doing, I think, in between his simulations or his compilations was he was doing the verification portion, right? He was just doing the mathematical checks to ensure the code was computing right. You know, maybe he was coding or writing down some things, you know, trying to figure out what his expected outputs should be when the, he got his simulations or even looking towards, as was discussed, maybe to what steps come next. But there's a lot of that when you're running and coding and doing simulations, you know, you should have those base cases or those test cases that just ensure that whatever simulation you're going to run is giving you the right results mathematically and calculations wise before you even try to bring in the expert and make sure it's matching reality. Yeah, and the, the engineering of simulations has changed tremendously since the days that, that uh, Hamming's talking about. He's talked about, you know, he mentioned, oh, I'm gonna put gravity in this register, so it's always there. We don't even have access to registers anymore. I mean, we, we've, we've taken ourselves away from that intentionally because now that's the thing we screw up. And, you know, so we use the compiler to build things. We simulate now so much faster than when he did. I don't think he even thought of, of this coming because he talked about, well, if I simulated any faster than this 40-minute than this cycle thing, I wouldn't have enough time to think about it. 
Well, now, rather than waiting 40 minutes, he might get 100 runs in four minutes because things simulate differently and there's stuff like the Latin hypercubes to pick which situations you can simulate. And then you sit down and after you get all of that, then you go through and, and you can figure out in the meta sense how to analyze. So you're getting the same things, but you're getting them now with some very different techniques than he could even consider in, in the ways that simulations were put together in his time. Anyone else? I got a few, John. This is a, this is a great slide tape. You really queued it up nicely. I was surprised all the MOOC students were clamoring for this one, but that's good that you're, the rest of you are all stretching over into being amateurs versus experts. So that was a nice counterpoint, I thought, in, in this about how having self-image as an amateur paying attention to the language, the jargon of others, let him explore their discipline through simulation. And turn a phrase, pointing out when they're wrong. Uh, just seeing him work, I'm, I'm sure it was never leaping out of your seat, you're wrong in front of the great thinkers, but rather, well, let's see. If I look at your jargon term one that says everything is like this and jargon term two says everything's like that, then help me understand. Why did you just say up is down? Okay, so there's, you know, a, as an amateur, solely by paying attention, you can be a huge quality check. And of course, this is why research is named the way it is, why, why it's so valuable what you're doing, cause, because it is natural human traits to keep thinking the way you're thinking and not necessarily go back to those root principles. I think too, having the non-expert in the room forces the experts to try to break it down in a simpler manner, which might give themselves more insight. I've, I've seen it several times with peers as they're working on their thesis, as they try to explain it. And I go, ah, I, that was my problem. Yep, we had this yesterday, the talk with Don doing my thesis. And Don was asking questions about ordinal conversion and stuff. And I said, <laughs> very, very annoying <laughs> question. Yeah. And I broke it down and broke it down and broke it down and say, oh, there's an issue. <laughs> and uh, yesterday in the evening, I solved it. <laughs> so it was very good to explain it in a, in a very, very low level way. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I had a few others, so this was stimulating. When he talks about stability, simulation stability, I think if, if I asked any of you, my, minus this lecture, if we talked about simulation stability, we'd usually be thinking, talking in uh, algorithmic terms. Well, our decision logic wasn't flawed. I got a loop, it stopped short, some kind of thing like that. But John, any context there? When he was talking about stability, could you tell what he was talking about? What kind of stability, the nature of instability? He talked more in broad terms of when you're framing your simula your problem for simulation. That was actually one thing I kind of wish he had gone a little bit more in detail. And I, I went back through some of the video to see if he did. And that, that's one point and maybe Professor Eisenhower can shed some insight as kind of the s simulation expert in the room. Yeah, no, I think what he's looking at is the stability of the solution, you know, so especially if you're running something that's stochastic or you're running something, you know, where you're inputting the, ra the randomness to mimic what happens in reality, the different, you know, if you were to say, let's take the atmosphere, if you were to want to add the randomness to that, and so he was modeling that some way, and then what he would be looking for is, would be at the end of each run, is he getting a solution for the, uh, for the rocket that's similar 
you know, and so what is the error between the different runs given all those different parameters and things like that. So when he says stability, you know, you can have, you know, a system that is stable, it, it you know, kind of comes out and every time you get a solution, it's within a neighborhood, plus or minus range, if you will. Or you could get something that blows up sometimes, you know, blows up goes to infinity or negative infinity as it will, and just doesn't ever kind of come out to some stability. And that's what he, when he talks about stability, he's not necessarily talking about the stability of the code. You know, if you put the same parameters in, the code runs every time and it gives you the same answer. That's a stable code. But if you start to kind of put some other things in here, does your, do your results when they come out, when you're adding the stochastic aspect to them, as an example, there's other ways to do this too, but as an example, you know, is that solution stable or is it an unstable solution? Population models do that a lot. There's a lot of population models, especially if you don't have any, if you only have one, one animal, but a predator prey model could have all kinds of different types of stability at the, at the end, depending on the inputs. I, I think as a mathematician and engineer, he was probably talking more about equational stability where there's things like stiff equations and a very, very, very tiny change in input parameter can give you a dramatically different result yeah. and output just based on the, just, just the equation and, and the situation that, that you put together. And that's one type of stability. You, you've mentioned yeah. another type where the, where the stability of the uh, outputs are one thing, you know, and, and you can think of it as dynamic and static stability in, 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 you know, airplanes or whatever, you know, drop a ping pong ball into a bowl. On the inside, it's dynamically stable. It's going to end up stopping in, in the inside in the middle. There's one kind of stability. You flip the bowl upside down, it's going to roll off. But yeah. I think well, the, way that's Hamming, a great point. the way Hamming deals with things from his mathematical aspect, he would have been in the very, very, very beginning, before he even started coding anything, he would have been looking at an equation going, this equation's unstable. How the hell am I even going to ever get an answer out of this thing? Because, you know, you can change something by a thousandth of a second, and it gives you a completely opposite answer. And there's types of Taylor series that do that. And he'd be looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah, Lauren, that's a, that's a great point. And in modeling today, we would call that sensitivity analysis. As you change input parameters and you check what it does to the solution, you know, that's, that's our sensitivity analysis on our parameters and things like that. Yeah. You guys are in the, going in the exact right direction, except even more so. Here's another amazing book. I think I got this for a buck three ninety eight. It's a Dover Press book back in the day. Numerical Methods for Scientists and Engineers by R. W. Hamming, second edition. Okay, let's check too. here. Pardon? I have one of those too. It's driven me crazy. Yeah, yeah. So you get to double down on this one, uh, Lauren. Let's see. Uh, Forty five chapters. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. There's a chapter after 45 called N plus one, the art of computing for sciences, scientists and engineers. And, oh, it's got 721 pages, second edition. Okay, does anybody recall what Hamming's uh, Turing Award was for? Being an all-around great guy, the being aircraft. the president of ACM for the first president, no, no, any other nominations? Well, the Eric Eric methods. Code? You would think. Error correcting codes or hamming windows or one of the other things. No, no. Numerical methods. Oh, what happens when every equation doesn't simulate right. What happens when every numerical equation explodes and can't converge and you can't do a simple integration or a slightly more complex integration or a derivative or anything because you can't 
compute a polynomial. There's a whole section on polynomial. It's up and around chapter mid thirties that we get the wrong kind of simulations. And, oh, what happens when all of your math is wrong because all of the math is derived as continuous mathematics, continuous variables, but it's all shoehorned into discrete representations on a computer calculation. Oh, oh, let's extrapolate that extrapolation. They had, I believe the number from open literature, I have, I have zero insider knowledge here. I don't know who would, but when they were evaluating atomic bomb design alternatives, they had nine designs. Okay, so give or take one or two. Let's say you had nine designs for an atomic bomb. Oh, and by the way, the future of the free world depends on your next decision. How are you going to downselect those? Curious question. What do you think? How would you downselect if you had nine designs written with equations by physicists? and some experimental data on the coefficients of absorption and fission related coefficients for uranium and maybe some other materials and their purity. How are you going to down select that? Oh, oh and, oh, and uh, today's report about all the number of people who just died, both serving and civilian just came in, but you get those every day. So let's continue. How, how are you going to down select those nine? Good. Anybody ready to build nine atomic bombs? Nine, nine different simulations. Boom. Who was the simulation guy at Los Alamos? What could be more? computationally intensive and calling on the janitor of science and all of those computers, those people doing the calculations to run numerical methods to down select. And I'm, I'm saying this on tape because uh, alert me, call me in the middle of the night. If you see something on one of those videos where Henning says, this is how we do it. No, I think what you'll see over and over is one of the few topics he doesn't talk about other than how to learn to learn and working with great scientists and paying attention at Los Alamos is that's where it stops. Dr. Mandelberg and I have conjectured that this might be, I don't know, I don't know, this might be one of the untold stories of the atomic age is that not only did Hamming do all this other stuff, but he recognized through the principles of simulation, principles of numerical analysis, the fundamental importance of needing to run math and come up with computational assessments, simulation as a form of experiment, and the stakes could not have been higher. The stakes could not have been ser more serious. And we've learned anecdotally through, through his papers and stuff that are going into Calhoun that indeed every year, I think a couple of months every summer, Hamming went back to Los Alamos. Why? War's over. They had money. They had all the smart people they wanted. Why? We have ideas. We hope to pull the string out. So the story's not fully told yet on that one, but isn't it amazing? It is, I, you guys have said it. It is amazing how fundamental this is even today. Everybody good? I'll leave you with one tiny, tiny C story I got from one of my advisors about carrying forward an error. John, what was that statistic you had in the slide, carrying forward an error? 
28, something like that. Oh, he was, oh, well, that was uh, 28 different equations that they were modeling. And he had that, the guy that commissioned him to do it work side by side with him and was able to identify the error. Otherwise, it would have, that error right. would have gone right into yeah, the Yeah, it would have never done. And it probably wasn't until the mid-20s that they finally isolated that conceptual or equational or representational error and fixed it. Okay, so here's another carrying forward error. One of my advisors way back in the 60s, I believe, worked on walking machines at Ohio State. And they had this giant hexapod-legged thing that a guy would sit in a tractor cockpit in this in this walking machine and they'd go over ditches and down the field and and for years and years it walked with a limp and nobody could figure out why walked with a limp all prologue code finally somebody figured out by going through the code that one of the legs the code for that leg was missing a semicolon Okay, here we go. Yeah, carrying forward an error. How do we regularize, repeat that? This is the setup for you, Toby, and get what you measure in a future talk. All right, thank you all for a very interesting session today. See ya. So Thanks, Don. Thanks. Have a, have a good day. Bye, Don.